Your Omaha High is being sponsored by Best Buy Signs, creator of the Omaha Parks Program, OmahaFastFoods.com, Coles Pharmacy and Home Care, Certified Transmission, Centris Federal Credit Union, Shoulder, Rotella's Italian Bakery, La Peeps Restaurant, Performance Auto Group, Two Men and a Truck, Crane Landscape Construction, Shout Weekly, Mid-America Speakers Bureau, Farm Bureau Financial Services, Critter Control. Welcome to Your Omaha High with Andy Greenberg, the show that will leave you feeling great about yourself, Omaha's heroes, and Omaha, where we live, work, and play. So park yourself on the bench and have fun. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Your Omaha High with Andy Greenberg, the show that you turn into every Saturday morning to learn about great things, how you can help improve your life. You also get an opportunity to learn about a magnificent nonprofit organization right here in Omaha, Nebraska, that does some tremendous things for people who really appreciate it. And then, of course, we always have a special guest. We have an individual who has accomplished something terrific in their life that you can learn from, that you can model from, and that you can take and adopt it into your life. And quite frankly, I could not think of anybody better than a 16-year-old published author whose book has just been released. you got to hear this story just a little bit later as we're going to meet Mr. Brandon Bauer. Brandon, pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks. Thank we will, terrific. We will be back with you right after a few moments. And of course, as you know, when you view this show, we always start off with four motivational vignettes, brand new ideas that will help you take your life to whatever level it is right now, even to a higher one. So let's begin with a very, very popular idea and a very, very popular thing that happens at this time every year in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, we don't like it. We don't like it when we drive on the road and we are going to work or we're going home or we're going to a social event. And then all of a sudden, there it is, right on the road, a big hole. You know what they call that? A pothole. One right after the other. It is a nuisance. It's something that we simply don't like. It's something that could damage our automobiles. And we keep on asking ourselves, why do we have these potholes? Why don't they fix them? And then you know what happens? Eventually the city crew comes by and they go ahead and they fill in the pothole. It disappears and the road becomes smoother forever. And you probably even forgot where that pothole was. Well, you know what? That is representative of life. Our life, believe it or not, is filled with potholes. It's filled with distractions. It's filled with potential damage. But just like the road crew, when they come by and they fix it, you and I can fix every pothole that is in our lives. All we have to do is identify it, fill it in, and just like on the road, it totally disappears. So the next time that you are involved with a pothole, you say to yourself, hey, they fixed it up, I'm gonna fix mine up, I'm gonna cover it up, I'm not gonna think about it anymore, and it's permanently going to disappear. And of course, you know, when we go to the supermarket, we have an opportunity to buy watermelon, we can buy cantaloupe, we can buy oranges, we can buy a whole bunch of produce. How often, however, when we buy watermelon, do we say to ourselves, I don't know if this is a good watermelon or not. What am I supposed to do? I don't know if this is a good honeydew. I don't know if this is a good cantaloupe. Well, we look around and who do we find? We find the produce person, the expert. And we call over that expert. We're not afraid to do that. And we say, could you help me pick out a great watermelon? So what do they do? They knock on the watermelon and they wait for something to be totally hollow. We thank them, we take it home, and we enjoy it. We had no problems asking for help. We had no problems asking for assistance. However, in life, when we don't know what to do, when we don't know what to select from, how often do we rely upon our own judgments? And those judgments, by the way, we're not quite sure of. What we should do is the exact same thing that we do when we look for produce. Call an expert over, <laughs> ask them for help. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what they're there for. And where do you find these experts? 
either right in your family, in your social circle, where you work, any place. So when you're not afraid to ask the produce individual, a total stranger, to help you out selecting the right produce, do the same exact thing for yourself in your life so that every time you make a decision, every time you select something, with somebody else's help, you're guaranteed to make sure that is exactly great for you. And of course, when you go to that refrigerator, when you go into the cabinet and you pick out food, one of the first things that we all look for is the expiration date. Now that expiration date tells you whether the sell by is there, when you can have the food, when it expires. And by the way, we never go past that expiration date because we know if we do, it creates danger for us. Now that product might have been in the refrigerator or in the cabinet legitimately for its life cycle, but eventually it wears out. We can't use it anymore. You know what? In life cycles, we have the same exact thing. But the problem is we hold on to certain personality traits, usually bad ones. We hold on to certain memories, usually bad ones, long after their expiration date. If we began to train ourselves and say to ourselves, I am excellent at taking a look at things that expire in my refrigerator and my food, and I now begin to adopt the same technology, the same theory to other things in my life that have long expired their usefulness, you know what would happen? You and I would get rid of bad habits, and that's what it's all about. One of the things I'd like you to do is I'd like you to make a personal list of things in your mind, in your life, that you have been hanging on to for way too long of a period. And then just like something in your refrigerator, get rid of it, throw it out. It's useless. It does nothing good for you with the exception of causing damage, just as much damage as the food expiration date. Make that list, get rid of that stuff. And you know, when we go to a stadium or we're watching television and we have our favorite team and that team is losing, as a matter of fact, they're getting slaughtered. What do we do? Do we give up? I don't think so. I think we always hold out a ray of hope for a comeback. As a matter of fact, we cheer them on. Come on, guys, you can do it. You talk to the TV set as if you were the coach. Come on, guys, you can do it. You can get better. Try this out. Try this out. Try this out. Even if you're not going to win, there's always ways for you to improve your performance. And we do a great job of that. But once in a while, we're on the losing team. Once in a while, we are the individuals who are not necessarily performing the great way that we're capable of doing. Do we give ourselves that same self-talk? No. We give up. We walk off the playing field. We leave that activity. We leave that goal. We leave that achievement. And then we wonder, hey, how come I never accomplished it? Well, you gave up. You do not allow your favorite team to give up. Therefore, don't allow yourself to give up. Give yourself that same pep talk. Give yourself that same sense of self-improvement. Give yourself that encouragement. And you know what? You'll gain more points. More points in life. More points with things that you love doing. And let's review. We have these four motivational vignettes. We talked about the potholes in life and on the road that you cover up and they disappear. We talked about asking help for produce and in your life. It's called a coach. We talked about expiration of food items. Get rid of the personality traits that are no longer useful to you, just like you do food. And when you're on the losing side, go ahead and say to yourself, you know what? I encourage other teams to win. I'm going to continue to encourage myself because that is what self-motivation and that is what self-talk is all about. Now, it is this time during the show that we always talk about a nonprofit organization here in Omaha, Nebraska that does terrific things. We've all heard the disease called autism. How many of us are familiar with an organization that is called the Autism Action Partnership? Let me tell you a little bit about it. If you know a child with autism, it is very, very important that you get in touch with the Autism Action Partnership. Today, one in 68 children are diagnosed with autism, making it the fastest growing serious developmental disability in the United States. The Autism Action Partnership is a nonprofit organization that provides services and programs to individuals with autism and their families throughout the state of Nebraska. Its vision is that every person touched by autism in this state 
will receive the care and support necessary to lead a fulfilling and dignified life. With the funding and support of the Autism Action Partnership, autism services across Nebraska will grow to meet the increasing needs for individuals with autism. Be sure to visit www.autismaction.org to learn more about Autism and Autism Action Partnership. To help a person with autism, you may donate to the cause at www.autismaction.org. And now it is the time of the show where you are going to meet an individual who is exceptionally precious. And I gotta ask you something. Before we meet Brandon, how often have you had a dream as a kid or how many kids do you have that have dreams that don't do anything about them? Brandon Bauer is a 16 year old author whose book is now published. And this is not gonna be his only book. He's got a series of books that are also gonna be published as he continues to grow as an author. You might at this particular moment be meeting the next author who brought Harry Potter or The Hobbit to fame. You gotta meet this guy, Brandon Bauer. Brandon, let's get right to it. So you're an author mm -hmm. and you have a book published and you're 16 years old. Yep. When did you first think about writing a book? Well, I first started writing, about writing a book at age four. I, I'm sorry, I don't think I heard that correctly. Age four? Mm -hmm. Now, were you a good reader at age four? Uh, no. no, but even that as a good reader, you said, I'm gonna be an author. So mm -hmm. did you write at age four? I tried to. You tried to, but you were able to take your thoughts, put them on paper. Mm -hmm. And when you put them on paper, did you have anything else with them? Oh, well, I had little pictures I drew that weren't that great. Okay, that's okay. So at age four, you said, okay, I'm gonna be an author. And this particular book that you now have published, mm -hmm. you started writing at age? 11. 11, mm -hmm. no. Yeah. <laughs> so where did you conjure up this imagination to write a book at age 11? Well, I, uh, I, always, like, I always liked to read about Greek mythology and I eventually just wrote, uh, came up with the series and wrote it down. So it started out with a love of Greek mythology mm -hmm. at age 11. Now, when you're writing these stories, are you drawing from Greek mythology or are you making up stories as they go along using the characters that were already established? Uh, well, it's kind of a mix between the two. Okay. Uh, it's kind of my own depiction of Greek mythology where I have the characters and I can just kind of make my own story. So let me see if I understand this right. <laughs> because this is kind of hard to believe for an 11 year old. First of all, reading Greek mythology mm -hmm. and then taking the characters that were depicted centuries ago mm -hmm. and creating a modern day version of it. Now, when you went to your parents at age 11, <laughs> and said, hey guys, I'm gonna write a book about Greek mythology, but I'm gonna modernize it based on my own creativeness. Between you and I, what did they say? Well, they supported me. Really? And, yeah. Wow, that had to feel fantastic. Mm -hmm. And they said, go ahead and live your dreams. Yeah. And then let's talk about your friends. You go to your 11 year old friends and you say, guys, I, I'm, I'm gonna be an author. I, I'm gonna write a book. What did they say? Well, they said that was very cool, but they said it with a sarcastic tone. Yeah. So it seemed like they didn't really believe me. And how did that make you feel? It really didn't bother me at all. Let's see if we can kind of recap. Here's an individual at age four who said, hey, I'm going to write a book. Yeah, right. Okay, fine. And I'm going to draw these little cartoons. Yeah, okay, fine. So he takes his dream at age 11 and then declares himself the next writer of Greek mythology. And even to the point, within five years, he gets the book published. Now, I gotta ask you something. What about you? You ever have a dream and say, hey, I wanna do something about it, you never do it? You gotta continue to listen to the way Brandon has established himself as an author, learn from it, and just take whatever dream you have and adopt his style. So the name of the book is Heroes of the Light. Mm -hmm. And it is a fantastic book. And what I'd like to be able to understand is what's the book about? Who are the characters? How did you develop them? Well, first, well, the main characters are Hercules and Perseus. And what happens is uh, Hercules gets sent back in time, but he doesn't know how. So throughout the book, he's, try he's trying to find out how. And then he hears that his uh, half-brother Perseus got kidnapped. And now he's trying to save him. 
So he goes back in the time when there were no time machines, so I can yes. understand how that became rather perplexing to him. He's got his half-brother. You're pronouncing names of characters that even at my age, I can't. And so he, so he helps Perseus out. Mm -hmm. And I just want to pause for a minute. No one else has ever written anything like this, correct? correct. Yeah, correct. And nobody has ever connected Hercules, unless I'm wrong, with uh, Greek mythology characters. Mm -hmm. And you said to yourself, you know what? Just because nobody else has done it, there's no reason I shouldn't. Is, is that a good way to look at it? Yeah. So what kind of emotions, what kind of personality characters, characterizations, did you put into your characters in the book? Well, uh, most of them have a very serious tone. But for a couple of them, I kind of put a comedic twist on them. So you, <laughs> you have a comedic twist mm -hmm. with Hercules and all the traumas that they went through. How do you develop the right words? How do you develop the right thought process to get this done? Well, it definitely takes me a while. But uh, as soon as I come up with something, I just write it down. You just go right, go right to the computer and write mm -hmm. it down. So how often did you get frustrated when something just didn't come to your mind? Well, I mean, it usually always came to my mind pretty quickly. Well, I, and I wrote down the outline of the book before I wrote it. Really? You yeah. planned ahead? Yeah. <laughs> well, I got to pause. Here, here's an individual, age 11, 12, 13, 14, doesn't matter. Planned ahead, knew what the vision was going to be, and then set out to make it happen. You know, we talk so often about planning, and we wonder, can it be done? Well, if this fella can do it. <laughs> I got to tell you, you and I can do the exact same thing. Not only can we do the exact same thing, we should. <laughs> so how long did it take you to finish the book? Uh, it took me about a year. Did you ever think about giving up? Well, I never really thought of giving up at most. I thought of making the series a bit shorter. Okay. But then after a day, a day or two, I got over my frustrations uh -huh. and just went, to, went, went with my original plan. So he took a look at alternatives, but then went ahead with his original plan and just didn't deviate from it. All right, so you got the manuscript finished. Mm -hmm. Between you and I, anybody can do that. Anybody could write a manuscript. Mm -hmm. But what gave you the audacity to start to look for publishers? Well, uh, as soon as the book was finished and me and my mom went through editing it one time, we looked up a bunch of publishers and sent out a copy to each of them. And um, you must have gotten rejected. Yeah. Yeah, how'd that feel? You put a year's worth of work into it. Somebody sends you a letter, if, you would, if they were that nice in doing it, and said, sorry, thank you so much for submitting it. This is not the kind of book we want. How, how'd that make you feel? It must have been terrible to be rejected. Well, I mean, I only got rejected one time, but by the time I heard about it, I was already accepted, so it didn't really make me feel down anything like that. So how long did, did it actually take you to find a publisher? Eh, a couple weeks. <laughs> now I find this difficult to believe. A couple of weeks, most, most authors take months, years to find a publisher. You must have had a high sense of confidence in mm -hmm. order to get this done. Yeah. So how'd you feel when you got the letter or the phone call, whatever it was, email, that said, hey, you've been accepted as an author? I, I felt very excited. I bet you did. Yeah. I bet you did, and I don't blame you. Now, I, I gotta ask you something. J just between you and I, I'm terrible in grammar. I'm awful. And how did you, how were you able to take your thoughts and put it into something cohesive so that the grammar was correct, the genders were correct, sentence structure was correct? How do you know all this stuff? Well, when, if it comes to something redundant, kind of like a character gender, uh, I just write it down so I remember. Uh, but when it comes to grammar, I, my mom and I went through it dozens of times trying to make everything perfect. So your mom helped you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, on another note, and just again, I know your teachers are not watching this. Mm -hmm. So you're in high school now, right? And you wrote a book, so w does your mom help you with the grammar homework in any Eng English course that you're taking now, or, or she stopped doing that and you're on your own? You can just tell me this because the teachers are not watching. Well, uh, I, I try to do all my homework by myself. Okay. So. <laughs> just, wanted to, just wanted to clear that up. All right, so you got the first book out of the way. Are you done? No. There's going to be at least six more books in this series. Wait a minute, wait just a minute. <laughs> Wait a minute, six more books? Mm -hmm. And are they written already? Are they planned out? Are they mapped out? They're all planned out, but I've written the second one, and I'm currently writing the third one. And how long does it take you to write a book? 
Well, half a year to a year. That's, and how much time do you dedicate to that? That's really pretty good. A few hours a day. A few hours a day, you mm -hmm. get it done. And are the stories going to be the same, the same characters, or you've got different characters? Kind of give us some insights without giving the story away. Well, the first book is about Hercules, as I said. And then the second book is about a completely new set of characters. And then it kind of switches uh, throughout each book. And is it the same theme as Greek mythology for modern day times? Uh, well, it's, it's, not, it's not really modern. I'd say like 680 probably. But, uh, uh, so back to 680 is yeah. when you're gonna take people back. So as a reader, how do you wanna make me feel as a reader? Because I'm certain that when you write these books, you write them for the reader. Mm -hmm. What do you want me as a reader or your age group to feel? Well, I want you to feel uh, very excited whenever you pick up the book and start reading it. And you want me to feel happy uh, for the characters? You want me to feel sad for the characters? Do you want me to laugh at some of the comic, the uh, comedic, comedic material you put into it? Well, all of them. I all mean, of them? Yeah, I want you to feel a lot of emotions. Absolutely. So each book will have a different characterization, mm -hmm. and each one will have some comedy in it, they'll have some adventure in it, they'll have some action in it. Mm -hmm. And what's your target market? How old should your reader be? Uh, I was thinking preteens and teenagers. All right, yeah. preteens and te just about the same group that reads the Harry Potters and that reads all the Hobbits. Mm -hmm. Now, let, let's kind of review for a moment. You've heard a story about an individual, again, age four, then at age 11, finished his first book at age 16, has plans for seven more. Now, the reason Brandon is on the show is so that each and every one of us can learn from his experiences. Each and every one of us can take his background, his precious personality, and accomplish anything that we want. There's basically no limits to what you and I can accomplish. Being an author, getting published, is not the easiest thing in the world, nor is anything else. But when you have the tenacity, when you have the perseverance, and I think one word is coming out real clear, <laughs> When you have the belief in what you do, that belief is transferred to other people who will and can make your dreams come true. So you've got seven books. Mm -hmm. What about TV? What about movies? What about internet series? Where, where, do, where do you th see this thing going for you? Well, if it so sells enough copies and becomes popular, uh, even movies or TV shows would work, but I kind of would prefer a TV show. So that the care, so that the audience knows everything that, that goes on in the book. So the so that the television audience can actually visualize the characters. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you consider the hardest thing in doing in writing a book? If you were going to give some suggestions to somebody on how to write a book, what what some what are some of the ideas you'd give them? Uh, to plan things to plan things ahead, uh, and just never give up. Plan things ahead and absolutely never give up. Mm -hmm. Now, are there any personal obstacles in your life that you had to overcome? Uh, well, when I was a lot younger, I had a speech impairment. And then I was always slower than the other kids when it came to running and sports. But that didn't affect your perseverance. It didn't affect you achieving your goals. And as a matter of fact, I'm probably going to suggest that when you have these speech impediments, which, by the way, I can't tell. <laughs> You're, it's, whatever happened is absolutely terrific for you. Mm -hmm. And now you've overcome those and have become an exceptionally established author. That, now, when you get done with these seven books, mm -hmm. what's next after this series of books? Well, if this series does well, I was hoping prequels, sequels, spin-offs, a bunch of different things. Prequels? I can't even pronounce those words. Prequel, sequel, and spin-offs, and these are all planned for you. Mm -hmm. Brandon, question. If there was one thing that you would like everybody who's watching this show right now to remember about you, your background, what you've accomplished, or how others can accomplish what you did, what advice would you give to people? Oh, well, I, I hope that you like the book and that you have fun reading it and that you, should, that you shouldn't give up no matter what happens. Shouldn't give up no matter what happens. Is mm -hmm. there anything in life, anything, Brandon, in the future, today or whatever, that would cause you to give up on any one of your dreams? No. Nothing whatsoever. I love that.
I hope you as a viewer love that also because how many of us, and we all know the answer, we give up. As a matter of fact, we find any excuse possible to give up. And in Brandon's particular case, four years old, 11 years old, 16 years old, has his life all planned out, overcame speech impediments, and said to us, to you and I, always continue to persevere, always continue to take whatever talents you have, put them on a piece of paper, plan them out, and get them done. I know that when we call the name of this book, Heroes of Light, we have a hero right in front of us. You know who that hero is? <laughs> it is none other than Brandon Bauer, who is our hero, the individual who has taken his goals and has turned each and every one of them into reality. And I know that you can do the exact same thing. Brandon, on behalf of my viewers, on behalf of your potential readers, on behalf of everybody who's going to watch your TV show, who's going to read your prequel, your sequel, and all your spin-offs, thank you for being our hero. Thank you for showing us the light on what it takes to accomplish dreams and never give up in anything that we do. I hope you enjoyed this week's Your Omaha High with Andy Greenberg. As a review, you learned four motivational vignettes. You learned about the autism capabilities of an organization here in Omaha, Nebraska, who does wonderful things, and you've had an inspirational story from a very precious 16-year-old, someone who is in high school, who has done tremendous things with his life. That allows each and every one of us to continue to be high. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Next week on your Omaha High with Andy Greenberg, you will meet Chris Bober. Chris Bober, an individual who, as a rookie in the NFL, was part of his Super Bowl team, the New York Giants. We want each and every one of you to come back next week and enjoy your Omaha High with Andy Greenberg. In the meantime, stay high. We'll see you next week. Take care. <laughs>